Welcome, everything is great. You are listening to Forking Bullshit, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. I'm Jason. We'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 2, Episode 6, The Trolley Problem. It was written by Josh Siegel and Dylan Morgan, directed by Dean Holland, and it aired October 19th, 2017. And I think we'll just get right into it. Chidi introduces the trolley problem to the others, and Michael clearly doesn't understand the purpose of this thought experiment. So Jason, do you have any familiarity outside of The Good Place with the trolley problem? Yep, I've seen it referenced in several things. Okay, so you had like a basic understanding of what it was before watching this episode? Yeah. Okay. I don't think I'd ever heard it called the trolley problem. Okay. I think I've heard it called something else. I don't know what, though. <laughs> hmm. Okay. So one of the reasons this thought experiment is used so often in introductory philosophy classes is because it helps students think critically. So that's why I think Chidi is using it at this moment. And we're just going to dive right into it. So as Chidi says, the trolley problem was um, a concept created by Philippa Foote in 1967. And we have discussed her before, actually, in episode 11, when Eleanor was waiting for the train to the medium place, and she was reading Natural Goodness by Philippa Foote. So we're saying hi to her again. So basically, this thought experiment asks us to discover which is the most ethical decision. And there's a lot of different variations on this problem, one of which Chidi actually describes the organ donor variation. But there's a few others as well. Were they shown on the chalkboard? They were. They were. Yes. Yes. The first is called the fat man. It's the same situation, but in this one, you're on a bridge under which the trolley will pass, and there's a very fat man standing next to you. So you could stop the trolley by pushing the fat man in front of it. So pushing him off the bridge making sure that the trolley doesn't hit the people on the tracks. That's murder. Why is it any different? That's the question. It's still sacrificing one to save five, right? Same idea as the organ donor. Suddenly, it seems wrong, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So the next variation is the fat villain. Same as the fat man, except now this fat man in question is the one that set up this scenario with the trolley. So he's the one who rigged it to not stop. Now, how do you feel about it? You said last time your initial reaction was murder. Still murder. Still murder, even though he's the one even who created it. Even though he deserves it. it. Ah, even though he deserves it. Okay. The next variation is called the loop. It's the same situation, but now the track has a loop where a single fat man is standing. And if you flip the switch, you will hit the fat man and kill him, but you will save the other five. So if the man wasn't there, the trolley would complete the loop and still kill the five people. So in this scenario, the death of one, the fat man, is actually part of the plan to save the five. Hmm. Well, the one thing in common of all these scenarios is the fat person. Yeah, apparently. And then our last one actually doesn't have... Well, we don't know the weight of this person, so who knows? It's irrelevant. This one's called The Man in the Yard. So as before, the trolley is hurtling down a track towards five people. But in this scenario, you can divert its path by colliding another trolley into it. But if you do that, both are going to be derailed and go down a hill, across a road, and into a man's yard. And the owner, who is sleeping in his hammock, will be killed. Of course, if you're in the actual scenario, like Chidi was in this episode or will be eventually in this episode, you don't actually know the outcome. But in these scenarios, you do. So in this final scenario, because the dude is sleeping, it's supposed to be better because he'll die in his sleep. No, it's it's very much like he's not even involved. Mm. He wasn't on the tracks at all. So basically, in this thought experiment, in all of its variations, we have to assume that all the people are morally equivalent. So none are better than the others, which Eleanor is asking about, you know, is that snooty girl from Rite Aid? Mm -hmm. Is it my ex-boyfriends? No one's better than anyone else. And we also have to assume that there are no other choices than the ones outlined. So we can't throw ourselves in front of the trolley. We can't yell at the people to get out of the way. There's not going to suddenly be an electric storm that makes the trolley stop. Right. 
So, Jason, what do you think you would do in the original trolley problem scenario? Absolutely nothing. You wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't do anything. Just like Chidi does in the first round. Because I wouldn't want the responsibility in my hands regardless of the choice. Ah, okay. So the thing with that solution is that could be as bad. It's where you see a problem and then you don't do anything. Right. So I believe it's the Good Samaritan clause that a lot of cities have as like a bylaw that if you see something, you have to report it. And if you don't report it, it's as bad as committing the crime yourself. Really? Mm -hmm. How would they know? Like if I'm on the street and I see someone getting mugged Mm -hmm. and I don't report it, Mm -hmm. how are they going to know I saw it? Maybe someone saw you watching it Uh... or maybe you were filming it. For example, the final episode of Seinfeld. This is what happens to the four of them. They see somebody getting mugged and they don't do anything. They're filming it and they're laughing. They're saying, oh, you know, this is ridiculous. And then they get arrested and put in jail. Oh, interesting. I did Mm -hmm. not know about this. (laughs) Yeah. So actually, I was going to discuss this a little bit, sort of what your thoughts are on this. Because since moral wrongs are actually in place in this scenario already... Does changing the outcome, you know, switching the tracks, pushing the fat man, does that constitute a participation in that moral wrong? Because that's sort of what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Do you now become responsible for the death, whereas not doing anything would make you blameless? Or does simply being present in this situation constitute an obligation to participate? I mean, we all would love to say what we would do and what we think we would do. Oh, of course. And given the situation, like Chidi, he suddenly finds himself in the situation and he doesn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So he can hypothesize and he can ponder it out for years and years. But as soon as you're in this situation, it's completely different. All your thoughts and all your research and readings have gone out the window and you're now suddenly on the spot. So I think I would like to say that I would pull the lever and kill the one person. But I don't know, because you'd still be responsible for killing that one person. Mm -hmm. So... It's tough. Yeah, it is it is really tough, and I don't know how to respond because I've never been in a very high-pressure situation like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I would be the type to freeze up and just not do anything. Mm-hmm. Kind of like cheaty, like just complete overload, panic, and then not be able to make any action. I think Michael's on the right track, though. I think pun not intended. <laughs> We do like puns, though. We do. Uh, (laughs) If Michael were to keep running the scenario over and over and over and over dozens and dozens of times, Chidi might eventually learn how to focus and think while in a bind, like well put on the spot. I guess, but does it really constitute a bind if it's sort of just the same situation being repeated over and over again? It's like... It's a unique situation. It's like those time-traveling movies, Right. right? Where... Oh, goodness. What was the one with Rachel McAdams and that British guy? Not Love Actually, but um, About Time. So in the movie About Time, this guy's trying to get the woman he loves to fall in love with him. So he keeps going back and replaying the scenarios so that he gets the best possible outcome. Mm -hmm. Right? So there's no pressure in a situation like that. Right. Because you know you can just do it again. Exactly. And these people that he's killing, they're fake people, apparently. Although apparently their pain is real. I don't understand that. But <laughs> it, there's just, there's no, right. there's no, no. bind, exactly. I think. Although I'm sure the anxiety pops up every time. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I absolutely love William Jackson Harper's delivery of the, the bits of the fake people are in my mouth. Like that <laughs> yeah. delivery is amazing. He's so good. angry and disgusted and furious and traumatized all in one. And it's great. Oh, he's fantastic. I think this episode, episode, we see a lot more coming from him, like a lot more acting chops Mm. than we have seen in the past. More depth, I guess. I think so, too. Yeah, we've never really seen him this angry. And emotional. Disappointed and emotional. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. So as he mentions later in the episode, there's no right answer to the trolley problem. It's just a matter of perspective, and this thought experiment basically allows you to evaluate what is most important to you. So the trolley problem explores different philosophical theories, namely deontology and utilitarianism. So if you ascribe to deontology, 
like Chidi does, pretty much. He's shown himself to be mostly a Kantian. Then in most variations, you would kill the five people. So, for example, the Fat Man uh, variant that we have, you would allow the five people to be killed rather than push the Fat Man to his death to save those five people because that would be a violation of Kant's categorical imperative, which says that basically you can't simply use people. Right. So you can't use this fat man to save those five people. He's becoming a tool. Yeah, you're diminishing him as a person. Mm -hmm. But if you ascribe to a purely utilitarian point of view, and the only thing that matters are the consequences of your actions, and you seek to maximize happiness, then the answer is to always kill the one person, regardless of whether that means pushing someone over a bridge, if that means that you kill the man in the yard, uh, that you kill the villain, etc. It's harsh. Yeah. The bridge thing doesn't, I don't subscribe to that whatsoever. No? no that it, just... changes, it changes everything. Okay. I think that's a common reaction, though. Because when you're thinking from a completely utilitarian perspective and all you care about is how many people are going to die versus how many people are going to live, you know, you can't live life that way. Mm -hmm. It looks good on paper, but in practice, it's a little bit more complicated. Exactly. Life is more complicated. Definitely. And I just want to point out on his chalkboard, Chidi wrote, further reading, Professor Pamela, and I'm probably not going to say this right, Pamela Hieronymi? at UCLA, and she's actually one of the consultants for the show, which I think is great. Uh, a little shout out to her. I looked her up and I thought, okay, well, how is she related to this? Did she say something about the trolley problem? No, she's one of the consultants on the show, along with Todd May, who wrote the book entitled Death that Chidi introduced to Michael and Eleanor at the end of Existential Crisis. Right. Yeah. Holds it up and is like, hey, we can move on to this now. Yeah, he must have been excited. And like, wow, they're reading my book on the show. <laughs> <laughs> he just like suggests it. He slides it across the table at Michael Sher, And he's like, oh, you know, this could be interesting. <laughs> All right, we'll move on. Tahani struggles with her attraction to Jason while Chidi searches for ways to engage Michael and help him understand human ethics. Tahani enlists Janet's help as a therapist so she can discuss her feelings. So I guess Jason and Tahani are, like, actually a thing now? Right. They're sneaking uh, off and pounding it out. Oh, my God. Okay. We jumped really quick from slept together once to being together. I don't know. I'm just saying. Like, you can sleep together but not be a couple. It seemed to happen pretty quickly. Yeah. It was very much like, now we're serious and we're going to have couples therapy. We're diving right into this headlong. Oh, boy. Okay, I really don't like them. And I think that it was probably really obvious as soon as this conversation began. Because I said it with a sigh. I was like, oh, these two. Right. Basically, uh -huh. yeah. What are your thoughts on Tahani and Jason? I don't know. I think Jason can really help Tahani. Okay. Better herself. Maybe bring her back down to Earth, quote unquote. Mm. Because <laughs> she's still all up on her high horse. And she's kind of realizing that as the episode goes on. Yeah. She's controlling and needs to be the voice and needs to be better than everyone. Mm -hmm. So maybe having somebody like Jason could help that. Do you think that's his job, though? I don't know. I'm I guess not I saying just... it's his job. No, I know. When you're with somebody that you care about, they bring out your best qualities. Okay. And her best qualities might be hidden under years and years of family struggles with her sister and everything, so she can't really be herself anymore because she's always striving for attention and being the most important. Hmm, okay. So maybe there is a good Tahani under there that being with Jason just kind of brings it out. Hmm. You're like, no, I don't care. I don't like them together. <laughs> I don't. I really don't. Um, And it's not... It's not coming from a place of like, oh, I want Jason and Janet together. It's that I don't really like Tahani this season. Mm -hmm. And I find her attitude really frustrating in this episode. Because what the heck does status matter at all? Like, why does it matter if you're in the afterlife? Because it's always mattered to her. Her whole entire life. 
So it's something you can't stop thinking about if that's all you've ever thought about. It takes time to break down those walls. Uh, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> I don't know. It's just really hard. I'm. Just, she's so elitist. It's ridiculous. You don't think it's hard for her? You don't think she wants to be better? No, I don't think so. I don't think she's coming from a place of... Oh, I know that I'm, I've got these terrible ideas about like what makes a person uh, good and worthy of my, my attention and time, right? She's thinking about the fact that she's so ashamed to be with Jason because he wasn't rich and he didn't have this glamorous job and he's not, you know, the smartest person in the room ever, probably. Mm -hmm. But she fails to see any of his good qualities. She just focuses so much on oh, well, he didn't have a job and not in the good, rich way. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, as much as that line is hilarious, it's also incredibly infuriating. Mm -hmm. Okay. So even when when Janet asks to hear Jason's point of view and Tahani spouts out, oh, you don't need to hear him. This is what it is, like, blah, 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 blah. And then she says, oh, I just heard that. And she realizes what she said. I think... That that's her being controlling, which she is. Mm -hmm. So I think she understands that she's controlling. Maybe doesn't care that much about it, but still understands that she is. She cares enough to mention it and point it out that, oh, that was something I shouldn't have said. Well, yeah, because they both look at her like, really, girl? Did you just hear that? (laughs) Yeah, and she didn't realize it. And then after that, she's like, oh, wow, yeah. Uh... I don't know. I think I you're know. Uh, you're not choosing to you're choosing not to see some. I don't know. I just I really don't. I don't like them. I don't think that she's respectful to Jason, which I think I is don't, a terrible thing. I'm not thing. disagreeing with you whatsoever. I just I'm think just saying she's has the potential. She has the potential, I guess. Just like Eleanor does. Eleanor's obviously making more of an effort than Tahani is. Mm-hmm. But it's the Eleanor show. It's not the Tahani show. That's true. I guess I just. I don't find her as sympathetic this season. Mm. Last season, we got to see that through her relationship with Eleanor and with Chidi, that she was starting to become less self-obsessed and a little less vain, which was nice. And now in this season, even though she is very aware of the fact that she didn't make it into the good place, Mm -hmm. I just see her still clinging on to that like no they still made a mistake or it doesn't matter that i did it for fame and attention it shouldn't matter that kind of thing i guess i just find myself having a hard time feeling any sympathy for her right and anything other than kind of general frustration with her character well we still have to keep in mind that it has only been a week and a few days yeah i guess at the end of the episode we get a time jump yeah right okay well eh. Anyway, maybe I'm alone feeling this. Let me know if you're feeling how I feel because I'm just seeing a lot of Tahani love out there and I'm like, cool, but also she's just getting under my skin. So you're kind of like me in season (laughs) one and I'm reversed. So I think we swapped roles. Oh, goodness. (laughs) Probably. Yeah, I was sympathetic to her last season. I really like the line where she says, I even had a fling with like a less famous Hemsworth. And she says, Larry Hemsworth. And it's not Larry at all. It's Luke. <laughs> there is, actually is one. <laughs> which is, okay, which okay. is even better because he was so unimportant to her that he just she just forgets his name. Oh, my God. That's terrible. <laughs> I didn't even realize there was an actual less famous Hemsworth brother. Yeah, there's three oh, of them. Oh, God. Okay. She's the the lesser attractive one. Poor guy. So we get our rap musical from Chidi. The uh the couple of lines about the Kierkegaard musical. Yeah, it's pretty forgettable. I'm sorry, what? No. It sounds amazing and I want like a Hamilton esque production now. And also, I have found out that Lynn Manuel Miranda actually knows William Jackson Harper and Darcy Carden too. So it's possible. They could do an episode where he could like help and write some of the music. They could have that would a be amazing. Musical good place episode. I where want Vicky's that. torture is everyone has to sing. <gasps> that would everything. Be everything, and that would be amazing. Oh and God. it would be torture for you too because you hate musical opera style where they have to sing talk. Oh, and that I hate would be, sing talking. And that okay. would be part of the torture. 
but oh. everyone loves musicals but then they hate the sing talking so it'd be like the torture <laughs> but also the good part oh that's great well if it's written by lynn manuel miranda it might be good enough for me to overlook but a lot of sing talking drives me crazy and not in the good which way which is why i don't like les mis <laughs> which we do talk about this episode yes we definitely do yeah i like that chidi's his rhymes are actually based on a quote from Soren Kierkegaard's book, Fear and Trembling. The quote, teleological suspension of the ethical, is actually in the book. Wasn't just something he made up. It sounds dope. Mm-hmm. It does. Cool stuff. <laughs> and then we get really cute therapist Janet. I like therapist Janet. Mm-hmm. I think she'd be a good therapist. I really feel like Tahani just needs to have therapy on her own. You know, aside from Jason, maybe just to work on her issues. So not couples therapy, but Tahani therapy. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But then we have Janet with glasses, and it's so adorable that I almost want them to reboot so that she can have them permanently. I mean, I know that she doesn't need to have glasses, but she could have glasses. Oh my god. And I think that that's a good option. It's a good look for her. I love how she does the cliche, stereotypical, and how does that make you feel, therapist Mm. line. Yeah. It's great. Of all the knowledge and all the books that she read, that's what she comes down to. How does that make you feel? It's cliche for a reason. It's because it works. Yeah, it's basically saying everybody and anybody could be a therapist. All you have to do is say, how does that make you feel? Well, didn't you watch Freaky Friday when she has to pretend to be her mom? Exactly. (laughs) And how does that? Just, Just say that. Mm -hmm. Just sit there, not a lot, pretend to write stuff down, and ask, how do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right, we'll move on. Michael tells Chidi that he needs something more concrete to help him understand ethics, and he makes the trolley problem real. Janet gives Jason and Tahani couples therapy with a few side effects. Okay, let's talk about Les Mis. Oh, God. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> so, so Victor Hugo is in the bad place. Of course, Victor Hugo is in the bad place because he created Les Mis and now I have to acknowledge that it exists. And he's French. So bonus bad points. Bonus bad points. <laughs> I'm a big Les Mis fan and Vivian is not. Yeah, I'm not. Not at all. Don't like it. Can't watch it. Can't do it. Uh-uh. <laughs> I mean, there's a few songs in it that I could like listen to i guess what about the story do you even uh, care no you know? i don't i just there's i don't know what it is it's just it's action it's the there's whole thing. war I there's know, drama there's redemption there's love you'd think that there's i would humor yeah you would think that i would like it and yet it's just this swirly mess that i just can't deal with <laughs> <laughs> i think it's the sing talking i think a lot of it is the sing talking if they just had music like songs but then they spoke regularly most of the time Mm -hmm. i think i could deal with it i think it'd be like not my favorite musical by any means Mm -hmm. but it would be tolerable right yeah tolerable tolerable Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) one of the greatest musicals of all time tolerable (laughs) tolerable i know I'm, i'm certain that there are people listening right now just shaking their head being like that's it I'm just shutting the podcast down, I'm just out. delete and unsubscribe. I mean, please don't unsubscribe. But <laughs> write a it's nasty just my letter. Feelings. Ooh, do that. Write a nasty letter to V telling her why Les Mis is so amazing. Oh, please don't. <laughs> it's just, you know, love what you love, meh what you meh, you know? And I very much meh this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so did you like Michael's essay? Did you enjoy it? Oh, that was great. Yeah. yeah. The guy who stole the bread is bad. The cop is bad. The, <laughs> the prostitutes are whiny and they're also bad. <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong. Uh, well, is he, though? Because, like, what's his face? The guy who actually steals the bread. I can't remember his name. Jean right Valjean? Oh, right. Okay, that guy. <laughs> I couldn't remember if he was the cop or not. Mm-hmm. He steals the loaf of bread. Is he a bad person just because he stole a loaf of bread? To feed his starving family? Exactly. Is he? Kant would probably say yes, because you're not supposed to steal under any circumstance. Same with Aladdin. Hmm. That's true. But Aladdin wasn't a bad person. Why not? I don't think he was a bad person. He stole a loaf of bread. That's true. He's in the bad place. 
Oh, no. And it was a baguette, too. Was it, though? I don't think it was a baguette. It was just a long piece of bread, okay? Okay, just a long piece of... No, but like a long and thick piece of bread. Not like a long and thin, like a baguette. Okay, It was a loaf. It was a homemade loaf. Right. Okay? That's true. It wasn't a baguette. And I reject this premise, okay? I think that that's a bunch of bull shirt, okay? I'm not linking (laughs) Les Mis to Aladdin at all. Not at all. Even though the premise is the exact same. (laughs) Wait. No, it's not. Steals loaf of bread, goes to prison. But yeah, Jean-Paul but Jean. then you get the Jean. whole genie thing, which, you know, we never thought about the idea that Janet's a genie, but she probably is. <laughs> mm, definitely not. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Moving on. So Chidi says at this moment that philosophy is about questioning things that you take for granted. So obviously... Chidi is frustrated because he wants Michael to examine his life and his behavior and this system of the afterlife. Because Michael's just saying, well, this is how things are. I already know that stealing a loaf of bread is minus 17 points, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But if we're not examining our lives, the way our world works, if we're not being introspective at all, then we're accepting things as they are, and they're never going to change for the better. Which is funny, because Michael's already done this. He just doesn't realize it. He's examined the bad place, and he said, we need to change this. I want to change this. And he's come up with his own version. So he's already being introspective and re-examining his afterlife. Mm -hmm. He's not doing it for good reasons, I guess. I think he's doing it for good reasons for him. They may be selfish reasons for himself to get noticed and promoted. And I still think he's doing it for his own good reasons. But is he doing it for the good of others? It's re- it's all relative, isn't it? The good of others in his office or the good of others in on earth or like the good place. Like it's all it all depends. Yeah, that's true. It really depends on whose perspective you're viewing it from. Well, and of course, Chidi at the moment is trying to make him think of how things are for human beings, right? Right, And how the afterlife works for human beings, not for demons and, well, not demons, whatever they are. Mm-hmm. Not demons and not angels and you know, not architects. Basically, not immortal beings. Right. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's what we should call him. Because he calls himself that. He tells, An immortal being? Yeah. An immortal being instead of just saying he's a demon. But he's a bad immortal being. A naughty immortal being. (laughs) So, a nib. A nib? Oh my gosh, we're going to call him a nib. That's terrible. That sounds ridiculous. (laughs) I like nibs. Nibs are like the best kind of licorice. Mm, Okay, they're they're tolerable licorice. Okay. Oh my god, nibs are like Les Mis. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Michael is to Les Mis as nibs are to licorice. <laughs> that is such a weird I'm sentiment. So confused. <laughs> okay, so he's a a naughty immortal being. Right. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so one of our listeners, Alan at Chipper Allen on Twitter, asked me to talk a little bit about Buridan's ass, which is also sometimes called Buridan's donkey. It's an illustration of a paradox in philosophy on the topic of free will. Because this kind of explains Chidi in the first version of the trolley problem that we see. I love this because Chidi is basically this donkey. Yeah. So the paradox says uh, there's a donkey that's positioned between two bales of hay, or in some instances, water and a bale of hay, and he can't decide which one to eat first. So he attempts to choose logically, wondering, you know, is one better than the other, that kind of thing. But he can't choose, and before he's able to make a decision, he dies. (laughs) Which is ridiculous, right? But that's Chidi in the first instance. He can't make a decision. He's paralyzed, right? And on Earth, he was often that donkey. He was unable to make a choice. He was Mm -hmm. always paralyzed in that decision process. Luckily, he has other outside factors helping him make the choices for him. Like Mm -hmm. pushing him one way or another. But this donkey cannot do that. No. Exactly. Chidi is this donkey. 
uh, or he has been this donkey in the past, for sure, where neither outcome really happened because he couldn't choose. Mm Mm-hmm. And, of course, in this scenario, we see that the second time around, he makes a choice to kill the one instead of the five. And in various other um, iterations, he chooses, like, Santa Claus's over... What was it? William Shakespeare. Oh, William Shakespeare's over Santa Claus's. Which blows my mind. He'd rather kill Shakespeare over Santa Claus. Five Shakespeare's over one Santa Claus. Yeah. Is it because Santa gives hope to millions? Santa's not real. And William Shakespeare's already dead, so... Okay, interesting. You know, he's been dead for a long time. Like, a long time. But Santa, killing Isn't Santa, that's real. like killing childhood. That's killing hope. Right. And joy. And in this sequence, we get a really great reference as the trolley is moving past. We see on um, the marquee of a theater, we see Bend It Like Bentham... And Strangers Under a Train. Bend It Like Bentham is obviously a reference to Jeremy Bentham, who was an English philosopher regarded as the founder of modern utilitarianism, along with John Stuart Mill. He believed that it was the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. And of course, it's a reference to Bend It Like Beckham, which is an amazing movie. So good. Soccer movie? Yeah. Yeah. But it's so good. It's so good, and the girls should have ended up together, just saying. Is that okay. with Keira Knightley? It is. Yes. Okay. It is with Keira Knightley. And she has short hair. Anyway. And of course, the Strangers Under a Train is Hitchcock, Strangers on a Train. Mm-hmm. I assume so, anyway. It seems most likely. I'm wondering, though, is if it's some sort of foreshadowing, or if we're just playing on the train, trolley, strangers being under it, like we're crushing them to death. Mm. Because I I don't know how it would reference anything in the season so far, because it is literally about two people who don't know each other plotting to kill one of the other's significant others. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just don't see how it could. But the show surprises us, so it might have a little bit. I just wonder if maybe someone's going to somehow get crushed under a train to the medium place or the real good place i don't know who knows i doubt it (laughs) i think we're just playing on uh on the whole you know crushing people with a trolley yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then we get eleanor comforting chidi which is really sweet she's like see see it wasn't real it's it's fine you're okay like she knows that he's feeling anxious and she's there for him in that moment which is nice despite her actually enjoying herself Yeah, because she's not taking it seriously. Right. She can separate reality from these Michael-created fantasies. Even though I feel like it would still be very traumatic to see people die and have a lot of their blood splashed up on you. Probably. But I noticed that Eleanor is not being splashed with blood at all. She doesn't get get a speck on her. Because Michael's torturing Chidi and only he's affected. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He's really just doing it. To torture Chidi specifically. He knows this isn't going to get to Eleanor. Because he's like Eleanor. Yeah. Eleanor's like him. Which, what does that say about her, right? (laughs) A lot. And then, of course, Janet, we have her glitching at this moment. Um, Her thumb flying away. And her thumb flying away, which is weird. Like, it's a weird special effect because all of a sudden when her thumb flies off, it becomes like five times its original size. It inflates like a balloon. (laughs) It's super weird. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I think the priority here is to figure out, you know, why you're glitching, not to just keep going. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, she's already committed to helping them. So she's that's... she's like a me-seeks in this situation. She's got to finish what she started. That's true. Shall we continue? Michael changes the trolley problem to the organ donor variant. As Chidi panics, Eleanor realizes that Michael is torturing them again. Chidi tells Michael he's no longer welcome in his class. Eleanor realizes why Michael is acting out. We get another great Michael laugh. Oh, so good. So (laughs) good. You got me. Oh, and he's like, of course I'm enjoying this. That's what, that's why I'm laughing. (laughs) This is what I do. This is why I'm here. Yeah, he really knows how to do a very satisfying, maniacal laugh. Yeah. Yeah. He's great at it. I see why he got this role. (laughs) 
I really love all the little twists and turns in this episode. I love that he made the trolley problem real, but then when he realized that wasn't working, he's just like, okay, let's change it to this other variant. And, oh, I'm sorry, you're not going to get the bait on this one? Okay, fine, then I'm going to make you tell all these people. It's just, it's so good. And then he tries to improvise some volcano ridiculous problem. volcano problem where you can save 50 people or one awesome dog <laughs> yeah he, at this point he's just like throwing su- suggestions out there i love how cheaty panics really hard at that one too kind of like it would be really hard to choose between 50 people and an awesome dog it I mean... would be hard i'm just <laughs> oh saying <my> like <laughs> his reaction oh my God, it would not be hard <laughs> no, at all sh- anyway but his reaction is like no 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 <laughs> maybe cheaty had a dog on earth he's very attached i know that william jackson harper has a dog i know this because of instagram not because i'm stalking him but anyway <laughs> maybe it would be difficult maybe it would be different he was really cute it would be different if you, you had know? to kill the dog with like a blunt instrument. Exactly. And maybe that's what it is. Maybe you have like... to throw the dog into the volcano. Could you do it is all I'm saying. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> I'd rather throw the dog into a volcano than like. Throw a wheelbarrow full of people. No, Not a like, wheelbarrow, like a bus. <laughs> kill it with like a rusty spoon or something. Ugh, that'd be a lot of work. Oh, okay. So methods of killing really matter. Oh, absolutely. Okay. If it's instantaneous and like pain free, no problem. Do you think it would be instantaneous to Not, throw them in? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. You'd burn up before you touch the lava. <laughs> okay. And then we get Chidi saying fork for the first time ever when he tells Michael to get the fork out. I'm really glad to see that he's able to stand up for himself. Mm-hmm. You know, he takes no malarkey. I like it. I appreciate it. It was pretty intense. It was. It was surprising. great. Yeah. And uh, I think pretty much everyone in the audience was l- reacting like Eleanor was. Just like, <sighs> oh my god. <laughs> and then we get Eleanor who apologizes to Chidi for her part in this situation when she says, you know, I feel a little bit guilty because I was the one who invited him into these lessons, which shows some growth on her part, I think. You know, yep. realizing that she had a part in this. And then she takes it back immediately. She still puts it out there. I'm just saying. I feel like if he was like, yeah, but it's okay kind of thing versus him just saying, no, 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 it's not your fault at all. Then she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go with that. Let's go with that and just ignore what I said. (laughs) But then Chidi says something that kind of bugs me in this moment. He says, a tiger can't change his stripes. But I don't really think he truly believes that because he doesn't. If he does, then why would he have let Michael into his class at all? Or Eleanor, for that matter. Or Jason or Tahani. Really, why would he bother if he felt like people couldn't change? But maybe he's just thinking he's angry. And maybe he's starting to think that this immortal being can't change. Yeah. No, I think it it's definitely coming out of anger. Right. For sure. I guess I just hope that he doesn't continue along that line. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. All right, and let's finish up. Tahani and Jason's couples therapy continues, complete with Janet spitting out a frog as Eleanor confronts Michael. Michael gives the core four personalized gifts, or opposite tortures, to try and make it up to them. Chidi refuses the gift, and Michael finally apologizes sincerely. We skip forward one month, and the neighborhood begins to crumble as Janet malfunctions. The episode ends with Janet telling Michael that she fears the neighborhood is in danger of total collapse. Okay, so I'm going back to Jason and Tahani in this moment. Okay. Because this was the line that really made me angry at Tahani. When Jason says, I'm nice to you and you're mean to me. There's something wrong with that. Yeah, there is something wrong with that. I just... No, don't be with someone who treats you like you're garbage. Like you're not worth being with. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's how Tahani treats him. Like, he's just not worth her presence. Do you think she's using him? Yeah. For what? Sex? Companionship? Because mm-hmm. he makes her feel good about herself? Because, you know, he admires her so much? Mm-hmm. But, you know, he complains earlier in the episode, too. Like, 
I always tell her she's pretty, but she never tells me I'm pretty. And I think that she's ashamed of me because I'm not this banker who, or I'm not a scientist who forecloses on banks, which goes to show he doesn't know anything. But I guess it just really bugs me. Like, if I were in his shoes, to be with someone who is ashamed of me, who treats me like crap, Mm -hmm. who clearly doesn't want to be with me and is only with me because I'm one of the last people ever... I just don't like them together. And I know that she might show some growth later, so I'm willing to stay open to the possibility of them perhaps becoming a good relationship. But in this episode, I am very not happy with it. Mm -hmm. I don't ship it. Nope, nope, nope. Pretty much I hope it ends soon. If we're going to be honest, I just don't want it to happen. So you're thinking Janet's therapy is going to be unsuccessful. I hope it is. (laughs) (laughs) and then we get michael being really frustrating too with his whole if you can't take a joke defense okay that's maddening i hate that it's probably a lot because of the internet where people are just like oh it's just a joke bro lighten up whatever if you ever get ever so slightly offended at something someone says Mm -hmm. which most of the time is super offensive so that's just my like gut reaction of wanting to slap him in the head Mm -hmm. (laughs) he's basically acting like a primo douche canoe in this scene and it's really perfect for his character but super irritating because there's so many people in the world like this Mm. yeah and also the part about leaving it to the other person to be the adult to be the mature one you know oh well he'll get over it it's not a big deal i'm not gonna apologize i don't have to do any work it's all on them yeah exactly no No, 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 no. If you're like this at all, listen to Eleanor. She actually gives good advice at this moment. You have to be the adult. It is 100% on you. So that's good. It's nice to see Eleanor, you know, understanding and recognizing dysfunctional behavior and knowing how to um, defeat it. Don't say stuff like, I'm sorry you got offended. Oh my god, don't ever say that. (laughs) Because that's just not an apology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. (laughs) And uh, I like that she sort of recognizes, or she does recognize that they are very alike, which is not good. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's like her past self is a lot like Michael, and she still thinks she's hilarious. Oh, yeah. She still thinks her past self is is funny. Yeah, as evidenced by the comment of, uh, the, the Reddit comment that we get. Yeah. Okay, the Reddit comment was really it funny. It was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny, mostly because the two of them all of a sudden start laughing about it, and yeah. they share this really good cackle. And Very the... brief, but like, oh, so they were in sync there. Like, they they had a bro moment. Yeah. Kristen Bell and Ted Danson really do have great chemistry together. Yeah. They work off each other so well. It's it's super messed up. Like, of course, do not post anyone's credit card number on any social media platform. But, you know, it's nice that she uses her past mistakes to help Michael realize what he needs to, to do. Right. Which is good. She's grown. I'm proud of her. Mm-hmm. So you actually brought up this theory to me a few days ago when we were talking about the episode. And you brought up the theory that the gifts are still Michael torturing the core four. Mm-hmm. Can you explain how? It seemed to me that all of these gifts have a negative part of them. Okay. So, first of all, Tahani gets this ginormous diamond, Mm -hmm. which feeds on her vanity. And instead of helping her become, you know, more down to earth, like we were talking about with Janet, Mm -hmm. she all of a sudden is, oh my God, this thing is amazing and I have the biggest one. And if Chidi gets a bigger one, then this one's going to be worthless. Right. Because that's how the world works. Right. So (gasps) it's bringing out a bad part of Tahani. Mm -hmm. The balloon that Jason gets. Oh my God, it's Pikachu. (laughs) I mean, it's super dumb, but it's great. (laughs) And it pops immediately. He grabs it in like this bear hug and it just pops. So there, gone. Eleanor's shrimp dispenser. Great, absolutely fantastic, except for the mystery flavor, Mm. which is white chocolate. 
Although she says it's nasty, but she keeps eating that. Oh, yeah. So it can't be that bad. <laughs> she says it's nasty. Because, I so. mean, if you have unlimited shrimp and you don't like one of the flavors, then just throw that away. But that's the thing. She keeps eating it, even though it's nasty. Oh, uh, gross. So, and then finally the, the book with, like, with Kant's thoughts and musings and whatever. Erotic drawings. It's got erotic drawings in it. So maybe... The erotic drawings could sway Chidi in thinking, wait, Kant's kind of messed up. Depending on the nature of those erotic exactly. drawings. Yeah, okay. So it could be, that could be the small negative aspect of that gift. Or it could be that Chidi is the only person who will ever see it. And he can't share his thoughts with anybody else because nobody would know these thoughts and other philosophies or whatever. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Interesting. That's just a, just a little thought. Yeah. I can see that. I don't know if they were designed to be kind of like the froyo of gifts, right? Where it's good but not great. Right. Kind of thing. Maybe that's the idea behind it. I, I be. like that idea. They're good. Um, they're good gifts, but they're not great. They're not great. They're not what they really need. Right. Which is, of course, an apology. Or, you know, getting into the good place. Yes. But an apology at the moment, anyway. Right, exactly. So now I want to ask, do you believe Michael's apology? Because you have said before that you still don't trust Michael. Right. So do you think he's being sincere? I mean, I wrote the script for this episode and I said that he gives a sincere apology. <laughs> you wrote the script for this. No, well, the you know, the, the, for the... I had no idea. Congratulations. You are famous. Uh, shh, quiet you. Okay. <laughs> I wrote the little beat by beat is what I meant. And I said that he apologized in sincerely so you can tell how i feel but how do you feel i believe it i still don't trust him Mm. but i trust this apology okay why because i don't think michael realized how important it was for chidi that he takes it seriously do you think that michael is actually taking it seriously then i think now that he realizes it and apologizes that's the start he might not take his lessons seriously but i think the apology is sincere okay I guess a lot of it, for me, comes down to Ted Danson's acting. Because the first time he he says the apology, right, and he's being super sarcastic. Mm -hmm. But then he just flips the switch and his eyes get all red and watery. And the way that he says it, it's just, it really sells it for me. I think that was brilliant. Yeah, Honestly, kudos to Ted Danson. You did a fantastic job here. You went from being snide and sarcastic to being sincere and vulnerable which Mm -hmm. was really sweet to see. So we get a time jump right at the end of the episode. Again, what a surprise. Shocker. At least it wasn't too big of a jump. No, a month, which is not that big. It's it's a month. I'm still shocked and a little upset. Yeah? A little bit. Okay. Yeah, because that's a month of character development that we don't get. Do you think perhaps in that month we're just exploring some more philosophers Tahani and Jason are going to therapy. Like, it's just kind of an everyday type of thing. I guess. Yeah. And then we get to see Janet have a really large malfunction where the whole world starts to shake and crumble. Right. So I guess in that whole month, she doesn't have any other malfunctions. I assume that she has malfunctions, but they're along the lines of... The thumb and the the frog, like small inconveniences to her as a person, but not to the neighborhood in total. Sure. But it seems like it's just getting worse because she keeps doing it. Right. Right? We can talk a little bit more about that in the spoiler zone. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, we will talk a little bit more about that in uh, in the spoiler zone, which is fun. We're bringing that back this episode. So do you have anything else to say before we get to our mailbag portion? I really like this episode. It felt more on track with what I liked about the show. Okay. Yeah. I really enjoyed all the twists and turns in it. I liked that we got some really funny moments, but some also very sweet, vulnerable moments, too, in Mm -hmm. there. Okay. So let's get to our mail. And a one, and a two, (laughs) and a... Hi, my name is Jean Valjean, and I stole some mail, so now we have to sit through a four-hour musical about it. <laughs> ah! <laughs> okay, so... That 
wasn't a traditional male song. <laughs> Not even a little bit. But I hope you enjoyed how painful that was for me. <laughs> okay, so our first piece of mail comes from Alan at Chipper Allen on Twitter. This was in response to episode 17 when we were talking about Michael's existential crisis and um, the idea that the four humans can die. So Alan said, Michael can die, sort of, so why assume that the Fab Four can't? We know their bodies aren't real. Could they be retired? Existentialism is a weird thing for a show about heaven to bring up. The system of the afterlife implies that everyone's life has meaning. People should be good, as measured by the algorithm, and if they aren't, then they have failed to live a meaningful life and are punished. Interesting take. And we know for a fact that the algorithm is real. Yeah, yeah. We, we hear it again, Michael saying, I mean, Michael references it this episode, so it's not just a construct that he created for the torturing devices. And I I do remember reading a lot of people online have complaints about last episode because why would you have an episode on existential crisis in a show with an afterlife mm -hmm. it defeats the purpose so it's a very really interesting comment alan because i think it totally makes sense i think it does too i think that the reason we have it is so that michael can understand how the humans feel and how they felt when they were on Earth, right. which and is not, when they were being judged. Exactly, and not now in the afterlife. Yeah. This is them trying to get Michael to understand. A uniquely human experience, right? Mm -hmm. You can't experience this if you're immortal. Right, and though our humans aren't experiencing this anymore, they did. Yeah. And at this point, we don't know, of course, whether the humans are, are fab four, as you put it mm -hmm. can Very be cute. retired or or whatnot we assume that they can't die really because the means of torture yeah would kind of destroy them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there might be special occasions where their existence is just snuffed out yeah i think that the idea is that they can't be mm -hmm. or that it would be very difficult it would be like a very special circumstance probably just like of, retirement pro right probably a lot of paperwork too yeah, and then you've got to get that approved by, like, the head honcho of the bad place, and who even is that? We don't know. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> that's a lot of work. <laughs> I don't know, though. This whole idea that you mentioned, the system of the afterlife implies that everyone's life has meaning. I mean, I guess. If the meaning of your life is to go to the good place or go to the bad place, then, yeah, that's the meaning of your life. But if you specifically live your life and you assign your own meaning, mm -hmm. then that's totally different. Yeah. What if you assigned meaning that the very um, elitist good place has decided isn't good enough, mm -hmm. right? You dedicated your life to bringing beautiful art to the world, perhaps, but the good place decides, oh, well, your art didn't cause any great social change or anything like that, or it wasn't as popular as it could have been. So, nope, sorry, you're going to the bad place. That like, does, does that suddenly mean your life on Earth had no meaning? It shouldn't. No, it shouldn't. And I guess I see that because I think everyone should find their own meaning in their life, and I think that people should be able to evaluate whether or not their life is meaningful to them. Mm, right. So, to me... The whole system of the afterlife doesn't invalidate whatever your life meant to you. Anyway. Yeah, that's fair. But I see what you mean. It's definitely an odd thing for the show to bring up, but I think it was necessary for sure. Yep. And I think they did it well. Mm -hmm. Our second piece of mail comes from Katie at Katie Hawks on Twitter. She said, You guys, I am so, so worried that we aren't going to get as much Tahani and Eleanor interaction this season. Their friendship was one of my very favorite parts of season one. Yeah, we're not getting a lot of that this season. And we're I think, really not. I think that's the biggest part of why I don't like Tahani this season. Her interactions with Eleanor in season one were really great. Um, we got to see how they sort of butt heads, but also how they understood each other because they came from similar type of circumstances, rejection of from their parents, that kind of thing. And now we're just not getting a lot. I don't find we're getting a lot of Tahani, mm -hmm. actually, just in general. 
So I'm hoping that that amps up in the subsequent episodes, but I guess I'm not going to hold out for it either, though. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of her with other characters. Mm Mm-hmm. And she continued to say that the episodes we've seen so far seem to focus on interactions with Chidi, Eleanor, and Michael. If this continues, we might miss out on my other favorite pairing, Michael and Jason. Michael is just so intellectual and ignorant of the human experience, whereas Jason is just so human and barely has enough intellect to understand he's being tortured. I think Jason is the perfect foil for Michael. I agree with you. I think their interactions are fabulous, and they're always so much fun because... Jason gets to show how he's actually a lot wiser than you think he would be in those moments. In a really bizarre way. Yeah, but he is, right? So that's that's nice. I'm hoping we get more of that, but I have seen enough of his wisdom, I guess, this season that I feel satisfied at the moment. Mm -hmm. That might change as this continues. What do you think, Jason? No, I agree. Uh, I'm hoping for more group stories Mm -hmm. and not side stories. So not so much Chi, Eleanor, and Michael on one side, and Jason and Tahani and Janet on the other? Right. I I like them all together. I always have. Right. So. You're a big fan of the group dynamic, I find, in a lot of shows. You really like them to be together, working together. Yeah. Okay. And our last piece of mail comes from Anna, who emailed us and said... This has come up a few times on the podcast, and I don't think it's fair to interpret any flashback we've seen as anything but the objective truth. So this is in response to our side comment last episode where we were talking about how Eleanor's flashback might just be how she sees her mom, might just be a reflection of how she feels about her mom because she's a horrible person, so she might be exaggerating some of her flaws and traits, etc. Mm-hmm. And... There's no reason to assume that Eleanor's flashbacks are any different than any of the other flashbacks. Mm-hmm. Cold, hard truth, solid, concrete facts. Mm-hmm. Something that actually happened exactly like that. Right. Right. Yeah, I agree with you, Anna. I uh, think I that... I agree. I begrudgingly yeah. agree. I totally agree. <laughs> You're like that little guy in the comic who's super frustrated and he lifts up his arm. He's like, I guess. I guess. <laughs> no, I, I, I know. It's, it's just a problem I have with her mother as a character this season she Mm. just seems too out there cartoonish yeah okay yeah i think it's me trying to be generous to people when i shouldn't be generous it's very likely that it's just this is how awful her mother was and like you say anna in your email i think we have to accept them wholeheartedly as what any third party would admit actually happened exactly like that You make a good point, Anna, for sure. 100%. So we're going to head into a very brief spoiler zone. So if you have watched the following episodes, season two, episode seven, Janet and Michael, then you can stick around, hang out with us for a little bit longer. If you haven't, I suggest you end the podcast. Pronto? Yeah, pronto. Well, not pronto pronto, but like after the music or before the music, as the music begins. Perhaps sure. a few notes go by and you decide pause and then that's 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 it there. Yeah, don't end it. Just put it on pause. Watch the episode. Come back and listen to the spoiler zone. Yeah. Done. Go do it. I mean, it's like 22 minutes. Go into it. And also it's a really great episode. So we'll wait for you. You'll enjoy. All right. Although we won't. So that brings us to our non spoilery part of Forking Bullshit, a multiverse radio production. If you like our show, please leave a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. If you do that, that's really the best way for others to find the show, and it makes us so happy to log into iTunes and find a new review and rating from from fans. We really love it. Um, It makes all of this work worth it. If you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast, and you can always email us from our website, multiverseradio.ca. We will see you soon for our review of Season 2, Episode 7, Janet and Michael. Bye. 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 
Spoiler zone. Spoiler zone. Spoiling everything. Spoiling movies. Spoiling food. They're in the bad place. <laughs> All right. So I'm a little bit frustrated because I wrote down everything that happened right before Janet malfunctioned. And I noticed the consistency, like I noticed what was going on. Mm -hmm. And then we had the next episode. And I was like, dang it. I wanted to be able to say it before it was said. Anyway. You wanted to be like, oh, I called it. Yeah, exactly. I really wanted to be like, I called it. Such a hipster. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. I knew these facts before everybody else did. Yeah. The other hipster thing I have is that I started watching Breaking Bad before it got popular. (laughs) Didn't we all? (laughs) No. (laughs) All right. (laughs) That was my hipster coming out right there. That attitude. Sorry. (laughs) All right. So just going to go over them. So right before Janet's thumb floats off her body, she says, I feel great about giving you guys therapy. Couples therapy, to be exact. Liar. Before Janet spits out the frog, she says, aw, I'm happy for you. Liar. When they embrace. And before the tremor at the end, she says, I am very happy for the both of you. Liar! She doesn't know she's lying, though. I know. It's great. I love it. Okay, well, I kind of called it in the sense that I was like, is this some sort of... I was thinking it was the ride or die protocol, I actually. still think it is. Yeah? You Absolutely. still think so? Because the malfunctions are happening because she's going against it. Okay, yeah. Oh, oh wait. Going against her ride and die protocol. Yes. Not going against the Janet's can't, you know, go against objective truth thing. Right. I still think she basically originally almost created her own program by initiating this ride or die protocol. Hey. So she overruled her own programming Hmm. in season one. Okay. And there probably was no backup for that or not backup, but... There's no contingency for that in Janet's because they would never consider that ever happening. Mm -hmm. Somebody falling in love with a Janet because everyone has their own soulmate. So why would that even happen? Yeah, no, absolutely. It doesn't make any sense. So. Yeah. Um, It's like, mm -hmm. why would you make your window breakable if somebody sneezes on it? Hmm. Okay. So they would never think to program Janet's with this, with the ability to not do this, but. So I didn't completely call it. I didn't really, like, I knew that it was something subconscious. I didn't assume that it was because she was jealous in any way, I guess. Which a lot of people were like, oh, it is because Janet's jealous of Tahani and Jason. It's not. It's because she's lying about it. Like, she's lying and saying that she's happy because she's not actually happy. Right. But I don't see... This whole element of like, oh, I'm jealous and I hate Tawny. And no, like, not at all. This jerk took him away from me. It's like, oh, we had a relationship in the past and I don't remember it, but there's something there. It's you know? written inside of me. Yeah. Like the protocol. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Very yeah. interesting. So I also read a few people online talking about how each of the each of the glitches represents something. So Oh. The thumb being like a thumbs up thing or the frog being like a frog in my throat or the tremor being like, let's shake the, I don't know, shake the foundation or whatever. Just like how they all relate to a specific adage or saying or idiom. Oh. I think it was just people trying to find meaning in each of the, the glitches. Okay. You know, kind of reading into it a little bit too much. You don't think that's what we do in this entire podcast? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but sometimes a pen is just a pen. Yeah, okay, that's true. Um, and, for example, in the next episode, she starts spitting up coins. I, hey, if you can convince me that those mean something, then go for it. Oh, I know. I'm just saying that I think they're all just the writers trying to think of ridiculous things to make Janet glitch from. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, probably very true. But if you can put meaning into it, why not? I just don't think that the sub, the big, giant, like, 12-foot-long sub has any meaning. Unless all of a sudden you're going to say something about Jared from Subway. I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Anyway. <laughs> so this isn't necessarily a spoiler, but Jason and I were having a conversation earlier about... Janet's genitals. 
Yeah. I mean, if you want to put it that way. Oh, I do. Okay. So we were talking about how Tahani says that Jason is such a good lover, right? Mm -hmm. He's so good at sex. But meanwhile, a lot of people are complaining, saying, well, yeah, but last season he couldn't even figure out how to have sex with Janet. So how can he be that good at sex? Right. And we just think that she's a Barbie doll down there. Like, she does not have genitals because why would they create a Janet with genitals? Right. So in our season one, we also talked about Michael. I mean, one of our episodes is called Michael's a Ken doll. Yeah. So I think it's the same situation with Janet. Which he is not. That has been disproven because he says that he had to get used to the hanging bits. Yes, that's true. The testicles. Yep. So. So Michael's not a Ken doll. But Janet is very likely a Barbie doll. I mean, she still has a mouth, but we're not going to go there. We're going to. Because this is not (laughs) X-rated. Right. Okay. I think all Jason needed to say was, can you make yourself anatomically correct? And then bang. Oh, maybe she could have. Yeah. I think she could have. It's very possible. I don't know. We've never really seen her change her own appearance. She unhinges her jaw and Michael shoves Uh, his arm down there. Yeah. Okay, that's true. Which, okay, in the next episode, how does Michael do that and not, like, have his arm taken off? Apparently she, the temperature of her insides is, like, 98 trillion degrees. Yeah, but it's Michael. He's immortal. Okay, how does Jason manage to kiss her? French kiss her, by the way, if her mouth is that hot. It's probably not the inner mouth it's probably like her throat and her he puts a little thing in the little temperature stick whatever those are called a thermometer i just remembered the name it doesn't go that far down it goes under your tongue i'm thinking janet's insides are that temperature not like yeah but how would he measure that with a thermometer which only goes in your mouth i'm just saying unless the thermometer was like extraordinarily large or very sensitive i guess it's a special magical Good place, bad place thermometer. It's yeah. an afterlife thermometer. Okay. <laughs> Anywho. All right. So that will be all for our short little reappearance of the spoiler zone. If you've missed it, we know how you feel. We do too. Sad. If only you could see us. We're both in tears. Bawling right now. Bawling. Seriously inconsolable. It's like Alice in Wonderland, Pool of Tears style. Yeah, we're drowning right now. I don't know how our equipment is working. Yeah, it's a miracle. We are really looking forward to binging season two once this season is actually completed. Yes, I think this season's going to be a lot better binged. I feel like it'll feel a little more consistent not having a week in between. Yes. Yeah. Although I'm still really enjoying this season, I think it's pretty great. Yep, it's good. It's strong. Okay. It's tolerable. Oh, harsh. No, it's pretty great. (laughs) He's just getting back at me, you guys. Okay. Thanks for sticking with us. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.